Welcome to Wisdom Wednesday. My name is Jim Johnson. This is where we turn chaos into wisdom. 25 years ago, in my first chaos report, I wrote, if you begin with failure and learn to evaluate it, you will also learn to succeed. Failure begets knowledge. Out of knowledge, you gain wisdom, and it is with wisdom that you can become truly successful. In this program, we hope to turn chaos into wisdom. Our program today is on change dynamics. Our guest is Dion Carterman, a partner at Gray Matter Matters. He also has a podcast on change dynamics and a long history of being a CIO and IT executive. Joining our panel is Jim Creer, our CIO and special advisor. We also have Hans Mulder, our European Research Director and a professor at the Antwerp Management School. Joining us today is Alan Salik, Program Leader and Executive Complex, uh, and he works on complex uh, projects and high risk and trouble transformation projects. So, uh, so Dion, uh, tell us about change dynamics. Thank you, thank you, Jim. The, um, the basic thought I'd like to share with you is that um, there is a uh, contrast between the need for change and the effective change that is taking place. And that is, that is puzzling me. There is an absolute understood need for change in society that is related to digital transformation and all these things that we see as, uh, let's say, modern and hype sort of terms. The thing is that sometimes organizations fail to respond quick enough to the change that they see. Now, we can make a division, of course, between, let's say, commercial companies and government. They both react in different ways, but even there, uh, you wouldn't, uh, it's not the, the traditional thought that the government is slow and all the, the commercial companies are, are quick in responding to change. The government sometimes is slow, but it's touching. Some commercial companies are slow as well. I, I came up with thoughts on digital leadership. And what I see often is that digital leadership that, that, that is effective and real, genuine digital leadership is, is lacking. Um, and some of the elements that, that, that I would like to mention is that you have to have direction and speed in terms of leadership. Because the, the, the change in the environment is so quick that slow responses are simply not quick enough, as simple as that. So there are shorter times line, shorter timelines, and you need to go ahead with, let's say, acceptance of, of failure sometime, as long as you learn from the failure, as long as you don't make the same mistake twice. Related to that is the requirement of vision. You absolutely need vision. Where do we go? If the postal company doesn't know where they are going in terms of staying, sticking to their, their letter uh, uh, monopoly, then they will go down the drain, as simple as that. You also need power in decision-making, and that is different from traditional decision-making because there is this need for uh, imminent and, and rapid change. So power for decision-making is absolutely uh relevant um of course there is the, the the element of innovation as well because digital leadership is also about innovation and that's where the government sometimes is lacking because they rather steer on let's say predictability reliability rather than innovation and change so that that makes things difficult uh, a nice model that a friend of mine rick mars you, you might have heard of him uh, hans certainly does he he has a, an mba model and that model says more, better, and different, different in, in Dutch is an A. So he says companies usually grow from making more stuff to making better stuff, but the real thing is making different stuff and doing things differently. Uh, it sounds like a very simple model, but it is, it is an interesting thing. Now, related to that, and I'm coming a bit to the, uh, the end of the introduction, is that digital transformation is, of course, very much in, in, in the picture but it will never work without mental transformation. Um, there is a, an interesting research from the uh, research center of the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and they have investigated the, uh, the change and say that uh, only 25% of digital transformation is technique and 75% is the human element which might relate us to the, 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 another subject we have in how is the human element uh, positioned in change. So the, the, the thought is that the human element is vital 
and that should that it should take a, a huge part in, um, in 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 change. So um, to to summarize that, um, I would say that um, change is here and it's here to stay. It won't go away. But despite the fact companies and governments sometimes react uh, slow, um, and that that late response puzzles me, and it relates to I think the fact that digital transformation is not always, let's say, implemented in its full power. It is sometimes considered to be a word, a hype that people follow, say, oh, yes, we do digital transformation, very oh, interesting. But the consequences of that are rarely followed. Um, one thing that I've, I've mentioned earlier is that um, projects are growing in, in importance simply because the standing organization in the traditional silos is getting less and less important because of the the environment changes also the need to change the inside of, of companies rather than just the um, the outside so that's for just a few opening uh, comments maybe back to you uh, jim so um so dion you mentioned the, in your first thing about about decision making so we spent a lot of time uh, studying that, and uh, we came up with the theory of decision latency. Um, and as we as we look at that, we we see that people are afraid to make decisions. So, in the changing dynamics, how do you get people to to actually make the decision versus putting it off? Uh, well, I think you're right in decision latency. Um, one thing is the the culture should be one of accepting failure, making the wrong mistakes. Sometimes you'd better have the wrong mistake quickly than the good, mis than the good decision uh, months and months later. You can learn from decision making as long as you make this into a cycle where you, you see if the decision was the right one. If not, then you can, of course, change the uh, decision making and go ahead. Um, so the culture in organization sometimes is that success is the predominant element. You have to be successful to make the good decision. And people have sometimes a fear of making the wrong decision, making failure. We are taking a break from our show to talk about gaining wisdom from our success ladder benchmark. Every software project has risk. This is a bet, just as much as buying a water ticket or going to casino. Or do you know your odds? Do you know how to improve your odds? Our success ladder benchmark gives you your odds of success by profiling your project against 50,000 cases in our chaos database. It also gives you hints on where you can improve your odds. There are only few inputs and six runs in the, in the benchmark. After each run, the benchmark will indicate your chances of success. The success ladder benchmark is part of our membership. You can benchmark as many projects as you want and even play what if games. You can change this or change that. And each one will tell you your chances of success. To so get your success ladder benchmark, go to standishgroup.com. Now back to our show. Now, uh, uh, Ahold, which is a Dutch company very well known in the, in the States as well, Ahold is a um, fast moving consumer good company. They have introduced the failure of the week as an, ex, as an actual introduction. So no, no longer you will see there the, the employee of the month who makes the best result, but the one who makes the most interesting failure that they can learn from. So the culture changes that, that they focus on learning from what they do wrong and accepting in all, that, in all transparency that there is sometimes failure. And that reduces probably decision uh, uh, latency and you can move ahead more quickly than keeping decisions, let's say, um, um, uh, wrong decisions without being noticed. I guess the key to that is making sure that the people who are making the wrong decisions don't continue to make wrong decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And therefore, you have to have the culture that you are not immediately chopped your head off, get your head chopped off, but that they go, okay, you made the mistake. Okay, let's learn from it. Don't do it again. Second time, same mistake is pretty silly. But if you can learn from something that is not well organized in your company and improve that because of finding it out in all transparency with that failure, you can really improve the decision-making process. 
Hans, do you have a question? Yeah, I really like the idea of digital transformation because it assumes it is a transformation. While you actually said something very beautiful, Dion, do it differently. So what will be the starting point then? Would it be the current as is? Or would you imagine a future and then, let's say, going backwards into the transformation? What uh, me me mechanisms do you use to achieve transformation? Well, what I, in, in the advisory work I do, I usually startle people by saying, uh, if you would go ahead with what you're doing now, the future looks like this, looks like a mess. And it takes some time to convince them that if they continue in the, in the, in the best, with the best efforts, they don't reach their goals. So they, there's a bit of a start, oh dear, what's going And if, if I can reach that element of, of, of almost fear of, uh, let's say, going down the drain if there is no change ahead, then you have an attitude of, of changing uh, the way they work. Because that's, that's what it's all about. It has to change into effective uh, leadership, changes, decision making. Um, so the, 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 the transformation has to be focused on an entirely new way of working. They have to realize that that is, that is required in order not to go down the drain. And if that is possible, you can, you can reach something. Um, and it, in, in most uh, organizations that I advise, it requires so, some massive shaking people, shaking them up. So that sounds like more like a culture change. Are you, I, how do you, how do you start? Do you change the culture first and then change the, 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 the systems? I mean, what's your recommendation there? I think you're absolutely right that there is a, a huge relevance to culture. Uh, the, 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 the research that I quoted from the um, Erasmus University indeed says that the human element is more important than the technical issue. So if if the, all the technique is perfect, but people don't want to use it or don't are not eager to use it, then you won't, won't reach a thing. So now the thing is, culture change is not something that you do overnight. It is something of a long term. It has to start with the um, the top. So the, 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 uh, you have to show from the top down what uh, the culture is. Um, it has to be um, so accepted throughout the organization. Uh, not, only, not only the top, but down. Um, or the, there, there are a couple of organizations in the Netherlands who have their, their top management in the top of the building with their own restaurants, and the rest of the people are down in the, in the people's in the, in the employee restaurant, and they don't mingle. That's pretty silly. That's, it's an, an, an excellent demonstration of separating thinking and doing. Thinking and doing should be joined together. That's part of the culture. So the, the CEO should be walking in the people's restaurant. There should not be an executive restaurant. They should walk around and mingle, talk, uh, be an example. And that is part of the culture change. But it, that takes a while because these, these companies, they, they still are in this, this ivory tower sort of attitude. I wanted to, to, to go back to the risk part of the, the discussion um, and, um, you know, the point where where people um, and leaders are afraid to make the, the decisions. Um, and part of that, I think, is is due to, um, you know, the human human basis of uh, fear of, of losses is actually greater than than the attraction of, of, of a reward. So my question is, are are you, what are you seeing in terms of companies around managing the risk side of programs and projects? And uh, the one, um, one example I have is where you ring fence the, the losses, kind of like a stop loss in, in a stock trade, where you say, we're not sure about this, but we're going to, we're going to go forward and we're, you know, and so it's not going to be a total risk, you know, total risk, but they can at least get their arms around what that risk is. And at what point, they they pull pull the plug. So I'm curious to know what other um, techniques you you're seeing there in terms of companies uh, getting past that that risk hurdle part of it. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, issue, and I th I'm thinking of two elements. One is that the um, the relevance of projects in organizations is growing due to the, the more let's say loosely coupled organic networks. Uh, uh, philosophy that organizations have is no longer a lock stock and barrel with stovepipes it's more flexible dynamic etc so projects 
in that respect are getting far more uh, important. Um, but it is it's, it's risky at the same time. The good news is that if you do these projects on a short term base, you learn very quickly if there's a revenue or revenue or not. In the traditional way, it would take quite a while before you identify if there is a, um, a profit in the short term or uh, in the long term. Many methods that we see in terms of, let's say, uh, agile or working methods are short cycle. So they, it means you try, have a sprint, see in, a, in one or two weeks if it works. If it doesn't work, you stop. Um, and that is very much in contrast is agile working with a, an, a second element that I, I'd like to point out, which is projects are very hard to stop. And that is, that is, that is a, a lesson that I've learned uh, yeah. a long time ago. Sometimes projects have some sort of their own uh, mechanism. They keep going, there is a project manager, there's a steering committee and they keep going and keep going by the, with the purpose of being successful. They try to be successful. And by being successful, they try to underestimate risks and underestimate the failure that they have. And um, so there's an overemphasis on being successful and thereby not seeing the, um, the pitfalls that they have on their way. And that, that, is, that is risky. Mm -hmm. hmm. Jim, yeah. do you have a question? Yeah, you do you also believe that part of that is a lot of these project managers and, and executives hate like hell to say they were wrong? Oh, yes, absolutely, because they, the success is what we are all striving for. Uh, success is the beauty and failure is the, um, the ugliness. Um, there, there, there's a nice book saying the, the history of ugliness, which is all about this, saying that we, we don't like ugliness. But if you, um, if you see failure as part of your success, then that makes all the difference. And uh, executives and project managers want to be successful, so they, they strive for success and they even hide failure. Uh, many of the, the reports that we've all probably seen start from, from, from project managers start with the words, uh, we are slightly behind, but we will certainly catch up. There's a slight overrun of money, but we will be catching up. <laughs> they never will. They're just they hiding the do. truth. They never do. <laughs> no. Yeah. Hans, do you have a question? Well, I like the idea of success, but mostly it is predetermined by the business case. Would you then consider that having a failure would allow for more value so that it is possible to be beyond the original business case? How would you consider that, uh, Dion, on this, uh, yeah. this topic? Well, I'm rather peculiar about business cases because I think they usually are cosmetic. Uh, they're not the real thing. Um, uh, it, it usually is a sort of a, a obligatory sort of thing. You make a business case and at the starting point of the project is positive. Uh, if it's not, then you invent something saying, oh, we have some indirect benefits like security is going up and efficiency is going up. So yes, business case is positive. Uh, what is usually forgotten is that the business case has to be redone every one month, two months, see if the, if the benefits are still in line with what you are spending which is usually not done, which is part of the sort of cover up that uh, uh, you just, just as we mentioned, if, if project leads want to be successful, then a um, failure in the business case is not what they like. So the business case is a sort of a cosmetic thing starting at the beginning, not used as project control instrument in during the project, and it keeps going. Um, so I, I, I don't like business cases that, that much simply because they're not used, let's say, honestly enough. If they were used in an honest way, you would have a simple spreadsheet saying these are the costs. This month we have this sort of expenses and we have to stop immediately because it is not going anywhere. There was a dramatic example in the, in the, in the Dutch Ministry of Justice where they had a budget on a project called KEY, K, and they had 7 million as a budget. The minister stopped the project at 120 million being spent. And it was totally amazing that no one, even let's say at 7 million, someone should have put up the red flag saying, You spent 7 million, where are we? No, they continued going and going until they had spent 120 million uh, euros, which is uh, slightly uh, more even dollars. And then they stopped. It's amazing. Thanks, Dion, and our panel of Jim Creer, Hans Mulder, and Alan Salik. I want to thank our guests and our panelists for being part of the show. And thank you for being part of the show. I hope we have given you a few minutes of wisdom. 
We look forward to seeing you next time on Wisdom Wednesday. This is your host, Jim Johnson.